All right, we want to tell you about food shortages the world over because many places are hurting for food and shortages are doing what they usually do, which is harming the poorest amongst us first. But how long until this reaches everyone? Well, let's go through them first and we can make an educated guess. Last year when the war began in Ukraine, everyone was freaking about about wheat and cooking oils because Russia and Ukraine export a lot of that for many countries. And we knew back then that it would take almost a full year to feel those effects. And now here we are feeling those effects. But of course, the wealthiest countries have been able to secure their shipments, but as expected, the poorest have not. For example, in Mogadishu, hospitals are saying that they are treating over 1,000 emergency cases of malnourished children per month. Jeez. Can you imagine that? This is not just they don't get seconds. This is they get zeros, nothing, children. Um, the New York Times is reporting that Russia is playing games with the food supply in order to... I don't know, harm the world to flex its evil muscles. This is the headline. Uh, they're saying that, you know, the number of ships leaving through this region has plummeted, which is not actually true. The number of ships has been fairly consistent since treaties were reached in the fall. But the number of exports that are going to humanitarian aid has plunged because the wealthy countries are skipping the line. In fact, we were warned about this in September when Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke at the Eastern Economic Forum. We played this for you at the time. He said that when the first round of ships left the Black Sea, the first 80 ships full of grain, only two of them were on hunger relief missions. When in normal years, it would be much greater than that. Um, he said that the West needs to allow civilian ships into the Ukrainian Black Sea to deliver grain cargo, but most of that grain is going to Europe's wealthiest nations with only 3% now being dedicated to hunger relief mission. He warned that this will turn into a never before seen humanitarian catastrophe. Watch him say this. Excluding Turkey as the mediator country, almost all the grain exported from Ukraine is flowing not into the poorest countries, but into the European Union. Under the World Food Program, under the aegis of the UN, that is meant for the needs of the poorest countries, only two ships have been sent, just two out of 87. And we used to export 60,000 tons of food out of 2 million, but that amounts to just 3 percent that has gone into the developing countries. In the previous countries, many European, previous centuries, many European countries used to be colonial powers, and they continue to act as such. They are simply deceiving the developing countries. And I can say that if this approach continues, then the problem with the food is only going to exacerbate to our greatest regret, which can turn into a never-before-seen humanity humanitarian catastrophe well at the time you know this was a prediction reuters now is reporting that what he says is true take a look at the chart that was just published within the last week showing how humanitarian aid from places that usually give aid to africa is plummeting in the clip we just showed you Putin estimated that it was uh, below 3%. Well, look look at this chart where we were in 2022, um, 4%. Other European countries, um, EU and other member states, 17% in 2022, down 8 percentage points. So the places that are hurting that normally receive aid are not going to when the rest of the world is in crisis. And, you know, I'm not saying we can blame Europeans who are living with energy crisis, who are living with rising costs, but it's their politicians who are choosing not to send this aid. And how can people living in these hardships then advocate for other people. It's incredibly hard. Um, their leaders know that when they drag this war out, they are increasing the cost of living and creating a scarcity of food that developed nations will jump the line and starve out less developed nations. In Pakistan, people have to skip work and wait in long lines just to have grain to feed their families. Jeez. Watch what one expert says about that.
So that's interesting what he just said. It's not a lack of arable land. It's that the farmland that could be growing for the population is not, is being taken for urbanization purposes. Where have we heard that before? Right. Well, that's exactly what's unfolding in the Netherlands, of course, right? And yes. that's exactly what the World Economic Forum wants, which is to take farmland, both in the United States, Bill Gates buying up as much as they can, nor the Netherlands but taking up uh, New with Zealand. Ni nitrogen laws, and we're going to take your farms away from you and build apartment complexes. Right. And in New Zealand, we've had instances where farmers have been, have, have, got letters from the government saying your land is now ours right uh, for what purpose they don't they're not told hmm. now in australia there's potato shortages but only for frozen potatoes fresh potatoes are abundant so that doesn't really make a lot of sense uh watch this report out of um the same seven. amount of imports for half the amount of potatoes out the other end. The good news, fresh potatoes are unaffected and supermarkets are stacked with them. The problem, processing potatoes for hash browns, gems, scallops and chips. Okay, so that makes me think that this is an oil issue and not an actual potato issue, if they can still find the potatoes um, or just fast food restaurants are not used to like chopping it up themselves, so they've had to close. Um, we've spoken at length about the egg crisis. In late January, there was a factory fire in one of the U.S. largest egg farms. We showed you this video. This was the factory for Hillendale Farms, uh, which bills itself as one of the country's top egg producers, raising over 20 million chickens for eggs, and the fire killed around 100,000 chickens. Jeez. Well, in New Zealand, just this Monday, Monday another chicken farm had a fire. Continue. Unexplained fire, uh, killing between 50 and 75,000 chickens. Jeez. And this is New Zealand's largest egg farm producer. Um, not that one, that one. Um, that's, they're called Ziegold Farms. Again, super fishy. Why are all of these fires hitting these, these poultry processing plants and other food processing plants? I mean, come on, guys. There was another I mean one in Canada, a seafood processing plant went up in smoke. I don't know if this is the normal way of things, but um, it certainly seems, like I said, what the cluck. Uh, two weeks of egg fires when during egg shortages. Um, in France this week, farmers drove tractors into Paris to protest new agricultural rules around pesticides. So again, this all seems to be pointing to the fact that food shortages are due to human mismanagement, definitely not overpopulation or climate crisis as the media would like to sort of boil it down and oversimplify it. There is food. It's just not reaching the people who need it, um, which makes it so hard to stomach the fact that world leaders are opening up their coffers to shell out aid to Ukraine, right. aid in the form of money and weapons, when that aid is really needed in the form of hungry children. Um, I don't want to do this, you know, just to like pull on your heartstrings, because of course it's easy to show you starving children in uh, developing nations. But um, this is from that same Reuters report. This is a three-year-old baby girl who needed a blood transfusion through her scalp because she was so malnourished that by the time she reached the hospital, her blood was so deficient in nutrients that they had to give her a blood transfusion. Um, and this is just a reminder that aid to Ukraine comes at an opportunity cost. Yeah, sending tanks and $150 billion so that they can continue to kill each other um, is coming at a massive opportunity cost. It's coming out of a massive cost to people all over. And we said this at the very beginning. Who was going to be hit the hardest at the very beginning? It was going to be in Africa, Yeah. right? That was who was going to hit the hardest in the very beginning. Um, it's poor and developing nations that will be hit hardest. And, you know, some of the industrialized countries can absorb some of it, but then it's going to start to trickle there and you're going to start to see pro Then that's when the news will cover it. When there's protests in Paris, when there's protests in Brussels, that's when the news starts to cover it. They don't go to Africa. They don't cover these stories. Because, you know, there's th there's this sort of like, oh, starving children in Africa trope as if you're like doing this for the clickbait or it's not a news story. But it is a news story yeah. because it's based on a new geopolitical situation in which, you know, and who do you look for? Like, you can't blame the Germans. They're hurting because their leaders are jerks. And, you know, have decided that increased cost of living and uh, increased cost of energy is acceptable. You can't blame, you know, normal Europeans when it's really European leaders 
Western leaders that are all collectively being turds and deciding these things for other people. Right. Oh, it's heartbreaking. Well, I remember. I remember, like when I was when I was still in college. I mean, this was this was over ten years ago. I'm gonna have to, I because I, I I quote this often, and I have to I have to go back and find out who it was. But it was one of the one of the African leaders uh, was addressing this issue of like of of like not sending aid to some of these poorer countries. It's like, the, and and his quote was something along the lines of, "There are no amount of guns and no amount of bombs that will stop the waves of hungry people coming from Africa into Europe." Yeah. He's like, if you don't think this is your problem, it is your problem. Because like they're gonna go somewhere, and so yeah, it's just, it's just you know. I and I yeah, I read yeah. a quote today that said that Africa has something like sixty five percent arable land, so they could farm there too, um, but that's tricky uh, because they they still have so much gov- government upheaval. Um, I just finished Jeff Pierce's book, The Gifts of Africa, Africa this week, and he makes a compelling case about how you know Africa sort of when the Europeans left, they were sort of. It was like the rug was pulled out from under them and and it hasn't been easy for them to recreate um, their country around these Western drawn borders. And there's still a lot of corruption. Um, So, you know, I do think that it's there's a collective responsibility here as humans to look at who is hurting what, you know, without saying whose fault it is and just say, where do we collectively put our energy either into war or into people? And of course, what the West loves to do is to go into into Africa and to destabilize that entire area so that we can pilfer resources. And we don't want a strong Africa like, we, you know, we see a strong China as an affront to the United States in the West. Right. We don't want a strong Africa. So and all of the resources, the mineral resources and the oil availability in that area, if they were to rise, if Africa was to get strong, what what a threat to the West that would be. So we will never let that happen. We'll just send our military. We'll stake out in Somalia. We'll hang out in these areas and make sure that you don't ever rise up. That's how it works. Sadly, we've got more news to get. We also do give them. uh, We also do give them uh, in return is where we send a lot of our um, our unwanted trash. We send a lot of it to to Africa, Mm -hmm. basically, like to sell them our waste. So so like we take their resources get rich off of those resources and then give them some back in the form of here's a bit of money please take care of our garbage right right that's a huge problem in a lot of areas in africa yeah someone in the chat points out that sergey lavrov is in china is in africa right now actually russian uh, uh, uh foreign minister yeah russian foreign minister um lavrov is in uh, is in africa right now um and of course you know they've been they've been partnering with south south africa as part of the BRICS nations so i mean Not everyone is scared of Africa, but thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at Redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to Redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.